So comments or questions from anybody? Okay, thank you. What can we local electeds or people working in local government do to help restore our citizens' faith in government? I think we have the most power because we are literally closest to our citizens. We run into them in the grocery stores or, um, you know, are accessible. So what do you think we should be doing? Thank you. Uh, I wish I could, I wish I had a magic answer for this, but I'll just, I'll say this. It is really interesting. If you look at polling and how people regard public officials and elected officials, you know, Congress is, I think, all the way up to 14% or something now. Uh, Trump is the president is at 40%. Uh, state level officials, legislators are usually in the 30s and 40s. Sometimes you'll get a very popular governor who, who does well. Local government officials are in the 60 and 70 percent range. And I think there's a reason for that. It's not necessarily because we're better, um, but I, I, we cannot run away from our community. We see them at the grocery store. We'll see them out walking on a trail. We'll see them at church, wherever it is we go. And there's an accountability there that and a confidence and a trust that builds for local officials. So I think some of it is to um, is to use the fact that local government officials tend to be um, more uh, more popular, but also at the local government level now. Um, any of you who have been to gatherings of local government officials know that. You know, we don't sit around and talk about what creeps somebody is or how the other party is bad news. We see, we're sharing ideas and things that we think we can bring home, learning from experts or whatever it might be, and we bring those things, you know, back. And as Mayor Rasim Reed of Atlanta uh, told me one time in El Paso, he said, Ralph, I love being, being in, in rooms with you because I'll take your ideas and I'll bring them home. And the first time I'll attribute it to you, and then in their mind, you know, and um, and I'm doing the same thing with him, right? So um, I think there's it's a different dynamic at the local level, and I think we have to take advantage of that um, and not get caught up in the in the sort of polarized, hyperpartisan world. Um, and then, you know, I think we need to try to either run ourselves, which I, you know, don't have an interest and don't think would be of, of any, uh, any value for myself or anybody trying to support me, but working into those other levels of government where it is much less commonplace. Um, because as I said, I'll sit down with a member of Congress, um, and I have several friends who are in either the U.S. Senate or in the U.S. House, not just from Utah. They're as frustrated as we are. But they can't seem to get out of this box that they're in because they feel beholden to the 3%, and that is about the number of the population that actually dictates whether or not they get reelected uh, because of the way our system is working now. So some of it is reforming the process. Some of it is us just doing the best we can and having uh, what Bruce Katz of the Brookings Institute calls the Metropolitan Revolution take hold and you know, flip upside down the hierarchy of government. You mentioned civility a couple of times. In fact, you talked about a civility commission. And I wondered, given both the local and national levels of incivility that we've seen over the past year, if you have some concrete steps that you took in Salt Lake City that we might be able to replicate in Portland to promote civil discourse. Yeah, and I think that is just such an enormous challenge. I mean, I, I don't know, in my lifetime, I have never seen the, the degradation of civility in the public arena the way it, you know, it's happening now. Um, I can tell you we tried some things. I can't tell you there was uh, great success. But um, so when we had our two civility commissions, one of them was civility and the other one was civility and compassion, um, we 
did a variety of things. Um, we sort of tried to lay out for people what some standards of decency are in the public arena and had people sign on to them. Now, unfortunately, I don't found that those were observed very well. Uh, we went into schools um, and, um, and worked with kids a lot. Uh, and this, all of this effort around bullying, I think, you know, with kids and getting kids to be aware of and how best to respond to bullying, I think is a really kind of helpful uh, entree into the, into the whole issue of civility um, with kids. Um, we'd go into universities and, and work with students there. Um, Again, I mean, it, it's not something that the media seem to cover very much, and which is okay, but sort of building that real grassroots effort. I think what Greg Fisher has done in, uh, in Louisville is the most impressive thing I've seen in this country. Um, and he now has cities signing on all over the country and all over the world, and to varying degrees, uh, folks uh, truly adopting it. But again, I think it's all part of uh, the incremental uh, changes that can help change the dynamic. I mean, you know, in, in your collaborative governance work, you set up guidelines at the beginning of that process. And if someone gets out of bounds that, of that, they're asked to leave or to clean up their act. And we societally have seemed to have lost our way in doing that. Uh, for the most part, and um, we've, we've just, I think we have to find our way back into it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. Um, it, it's a testament to how important this issue is. I, when I was on my way here, my daughter was dropping me off, and I was telling her what I was doing, coming to this lecture and the subject matter. And normally she would say, Dad, you're a nerd. But uh, tonight, you know, it's really interesting. And this is a 20-year-old. And she said, you know what? That's an important issue, Dad. So I think young people are recognizing, and we're recognizing what a critical time this is. Uh, and thank you again for your, um, your reference to the League of cities because I think that its potential and dealing with some issues we're dealing with nationally, um, even with respect to Portland uh, and, and sanctuary city policy, for instance, uh, is very important. But let me get to my specific question because I know there's other people who have questions. Um, my question has to do with, I wondered about your observations about, uh, let's say, powerful indigenous institutions. In your case, uh, Utah uh, has the Mormon church. And and to what degree uh, do powerful um, indigenous institutions, what role do they play either in enhancing your ability to work collaborative, collaboratively in, inside government, these external government entities that are powerful, or uh, serve as a barrier uh, given, their, given their, their power? And I know it's a very unique, I know we have to, obviously a system of a, a separation of church and state, and I know it's more dealing with establishment clause, but with respect to your unique unique, um, powerful entity there, which is a religious entity, a Mormon church. To what degree did you notice that that, and, and what sort of lessons can we learn relative to um, those institutions and how they may benefit uh, our collaborative work? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. So the Mormon churches in Utah, I hadn't noticed. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it is, uh, it is the dominant institution. And beyond government, I would say it's the dominant institution when 60% of the population of the state is actively Mormon. And then there's another percentage that, you know, grew up Mormon and left the church or whatever, or, or Jack Mormons as they're called. Or, um, you know, it's, a, um, it's an incredibly powerful institution. And in Salt Lake City in particular, they are the largest private landholder, and the entire north end of downtown is owned by the Mormon Church. Um, so um, they are I incredibly powerful. What I um, actually concluded um, pretty early on in my work in the legislature is that people uh, badly misunderstand the Mormon Church. Uh, first of all, there are people who uh, who think that you know they have doctrines that they may or may not have, and then they think that they are out there imposing their will on uh, on the governmental actions. Uh, the fact of the matter is, with the Mormon Church, unless it is a doctrinal issue for them, and there are not many of them, um, gay marriage is one of them, but there really aren't that many of them. Um, they are 
uh, very, uh, I'd say, arm's length. They are incredibly receptive and courteous and responsive to the community. And in my experience, talking with mayors from all around the country, having the dominant player in my community, and almost every community does have you know one or two of those or three of those, um, was the greatest partnership I could have ever imagined. And I'm not Mormon. Um, because there was no entity that had a greater interest in the success of Salt Lake City than the Mormon Church. It is their home base of 14 plus million uh, people around the world. And they want Salt Lake City to look good. They want Salt Lake City to thrive because it's, uh, it's the showplace for their religion. Um, so what I found was, first of all, they were always open to discussion. Um, and I could bring any topic to them. Um, so, for example, this non-discrimination ordinance that I mentioned. Um, when I was campaigning and putting together the details of what we called our Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Diversity, um, I knew there were really sensitive subjects around things like the LGBT community and non-discrimination. So I had gotten to know through my legislative days some of the leadership on the secular side of the, L of the LDS church, and I went and met with them and reviewed it with them. And their response was really surprised me, I've got to say. <laughs> they said, look, here's where we are. <coughs> Marriage to us is defined as between a man and a woman, and you are not going to see us stray from that. <laughs> Uh, but we are a religion that has gone through enormous persecution in our early years. And we hate discrimination. We despise discrimination in our community. And we, uh, we abhor seeing it among our, uh, our members of our church. And what they were telling me, and what played out as I worked on the non-discrimination ordinance, was I could pursue that aggressively. Um, and as long as I did not cross that doctrinal line, which I was not doing, we were focusing on housing and employment, there was a chance, even though there may be the typical kind of homophobic responses, to those issues, but there was a chance that the LDS Church wouldn't uh, wouldn't oppose my pursuit of that. And we spent a lot of time with them as we developed that ordinance um, to reflect their institutional needs as a church, but have it otherwise reflect what we wanted to do within our community and, and the society. And we had been working with them, and even to the, you know, the detail of the language that they would find acceptable and the portions of the ordinance that affected them. And three weeks before it was scheduled to go to our city council for consideration after a year and a half or so of working on it, um, they shut off communications with us. So I started getting a little nervous. The day it went before our city council, I get a call, and they say, we want to come over and see you at 4 o'clock. Um, so it was like, yeah, sure, come on over. And they told me they were going to that night, for the first time in their history, come to a city council meeting and support a policy of Salt Lake City. Now, you can imagine for all of these people who were showing up, and a lot of them were Mormons or ex-Mormons at our city council meeting that night, who were nervous about how their religion was going to respond on the issue, but they felt strongly about it. They had faced discrimination and were going to you know, bear witness to it. How they responded when the first witness was the LDS church saying, this is a good idea and we support it, you know, what the reaction was in the room. Normally our city council will hear something and then they'll wait for a week or two and come back and consider the comments and whether or not to adopt it. And I was told at the beginning of that process I would never get it through our city council. Well, they ended up adopting it unanimously that night. Um, so I say that because, you know, we all have our own views about 
you know, something, a group, an institution like the LDS Church. But if we spend time sitting down and working with people, um, we may get surprised. Um, and, or we may find that there's some common ground we didn't expect. Um, so, uh, I mean, when it came to liquor law policy, we overhauled all of our liquor laws in, in Salt Lake City because they were just a mess. Um, and really inhibiting good, um, what I would say, just sort of good downtown and community uh, activity. Um, they were a real pain in the ass um, because they don't want their members drinking and they got, you know, really odd notions about what happens with people who drink. You know, there's no such thing to them as like a social drinker. They're all alcoholics or something, you know? And do crazy things, and you know, so they were they were difficult. On the other hand, in the end, they didn't stop us from from completely changing our our ordinances. Um, so I think it, um, you know, we certainly, you know, I stayed away from talking about gay marriage until um, the remarkable event of a federal district court judge in Utah. Uh, declaring for the first time in this country as a federal court that uh, not allowing gay marriage um, was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and then, of course, we saw kind of what transpired over time. So I guess I would say that um, they were actually a great partner, and I don't think people would expect that. My predecessor, who had grown up Mormon and left the church and uh, really had a really difficult time with the Mormon church, uh, personally, I took great joy at poking his finger in the eye of the LDS church all the time. And it served him actually politically well, because Salt Lake City is majority non-Mormon. And so it sort of fed uh, the feelings of a lot of people in Salt Lake that, you know, there's this dominant institution and they make it hard for us to get a drink or whatever the case may be. Um, and um, so I think when I came in and didn't have that approach to, to government, they were so glad. It's like, what could we, literally, I'd walk into meetings and their first question was, what can we do to help you, you know? Well, that doesn't happen usually with a big, the biggest business in town, right? It's like, here's what I want, and can you, you know, what can you do, you know? Uh, and that really just wasn't the way they approached things. Mr. Becker, um, you mentioned both uh, Greg Fisher of Louisville and Kasim Reed of Atlanta. And I'm just curious that from your observation, who at the local level, the municipal level, the state level, do you see as the capacity of taking these concepts of good governance, collaborative governance to the national stage, and who's interested in doing so? Because a lot of times we see mayors that have two successful terms and are, have no interest in running for governor or the Senate. So I'm just curious, who do you see out there? Well, um, uh, in the in the city's circles, there are some, um, I'd say some mayors of some larger cities who, uh, from my work with them, and it can be very different in a community, I can tell you, than you know, your sense when you're working with someone as a peer, um, who I think have tremendous uh, national potential, um, and who I think um, whether they, if, if you use the word collaborative governance, whether they got that or whether they just sort of get engaging people well in decision making um, as a concept, um, who I think are, you know, I would call really role models from what I can see, and I think have great potential for, for higher office. Um, one of them is Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA, who um, I have been just continually impressed with him from the time he got elected, and I've seen him in a number of different settings, not just sort of speaking, but also um, interacting on issues, and this is the way he works with people and engages people. Um, I think Mitch Landro in New Orleans um, is a remarkable figure and has oratorical skills, you know, that match Barack Obama and 
and Ronald Reagan, just so I make sure I'm covering both sides of the aisle here, um, you know, that has, has, has an incredible orator um, and very thoughtful. Um, I don't know if he's a great believer in collaborative governance, but I know whether it's because he comes from a two or three generations of politicians, he's incredibly engaging with people. Um, and I think he, he takes that, you know, in a very genuine way. Um, other folks, there certainly are others who I think, you know, are still in the public arena who have tremendous potential. Um, but there are an awful lot of us as mayors, most mayors are Democrats, and most states are Republican. So, you know, most, most mayors are in a difficult position in terms of thinking about or pursuing, pursuing higher office uh, for that reason. I mean, I Greg Fisher and I came to be friends over the years and that we were in office together for a whole variety of reasons. And, um, you know, he looks at trying to run for higher office in, in Kentucky the same way I look at it in Utah. It's like, I'm not going to waste my time and other people's time and resources when the chances are minuscule given the way, uh, you know, things are set up politically in, our, in my state uh, to pursue that. Plus, I really like my job. I don't, you know, I'm not interested in moving on. And people like Greg Fisher are, I think, I know that he thinks kind of the same way. Um, in terms of his pursuit. So um, I'm sure I could think of a lot of others. There certainly are some, some governors out there I think are, um, are good. Um, and I would invite others to maybe contribute their thoughts who've worked with others or who know other elected officials who might help change that dynamic in D.C. that is so toxic today. I mean, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Oregon being the least church state, or it was when I came to Oregon from California, yes, I was. <laughs> it was known as the least church state in the union, and that affected collaborative governance to a large degree because the founding fathers wanted active religious people, not any particulars, but man, they're good at groups, they're good at collaboration, they go to meetings. So the alignment between religion and governance seems to me, from my background, to be a little bit, um, I assume there's some collaboration skills in a religious community. But what I don't understand now is with the millennial generation's emphasis on common good and the generation I grew up in with government went from being um, a good thing to a bad thing, how do you relate to the nonprofit sector with their single issue tendencies with collaborative efforts? sector you're talking about the NGOs particularly not necessarily um, nonprofit institutions that are in charity or those kinds of things that um, you know I think uh, you know so many of us uh, find a particular cause that we want to devote ourselves to or who, who want to engage and do that and become advocates for that cause and those organizations you know, spring up to serve those missions, those individual missions. And uh, my experience over the years is that um, you get a pretty large range in how those NGOs operate, that is, or how they conduct themselves and how they pursue their mission. There are some who are believe that by being loud and combative, and litigation oriented, that it is how they can achieve their greatest success. And, um, and they pursue that kind of approach. Um, there are others who, who are happy to work within the broader, I'd say, body politic to achieve what they want. And um, th they both serve a really useful purpose in society, I think. Um, you know, my experience has been that um, that when you bring people together who may be really divergent, in including obviously NGOs, um, and the NGOs tend to fight among themselves too, even if they have a common mission, um, 
that um, if you can get them in a process, like we're talking about in a, in a collaborative process, <laughs> that uh, the harshness that sometimes comes with NGO activism tends to dissipate. Um, not always, and there's some, there's some organizations who just won't even participate. And I guess that's okay. You know, I think that's everyone. That's what the, you know the beauty of uh, of a democracy and having the tools that are available in it. Um, so I, I'd say my experience has been that um, uh, that with organizations, sometimes they'll take both tracks um, too, and that if you can get people in a room, including NGOs, um, who might be really fierce publicly about their advocacy, um, that they will over time go through what I think of as kind of a cathartic experience of invariably listening to other people's views and this sort of win-win that you try to get to through consensus building tends to emerge and they become part of it. Uh, but it depends, in my, my experience, it depends on the NGO and a lot of times the personalities that are, you know, leading that NGO and how they operate. I don't know if that really answers your question, but... Okay, one more question, if there is one. Okay, I've got the microphone. I'll, I'll ask the last question. I wonder if you could uh, reflect a little bit on the tension between place-based decision-making and state or federal policy, and how do you reconcile the need to put decision-making in the hands of the locals while also kind of thinking about or aligning with or respecting statewide or national standards? And how do you do that in a productive way that enfranchises the locals and uh, maybe drives the policy a little bit? Uh, I mean, I think that's a really good and cha it's a really challenging question for those of us. So I started working in the federal government, then I went to work for state government, and then <clears throat> ended up working in local government. I think that's a really productive um, scaling of my career. Maybe starting as a garbage man first was the epitome of what I c could do. Um, but um, I, I think people just relate well to local and place-based decision making and that's the reason it's, I think, consistently, you know, really uh, amenable to collaborative governance. Um, and then as you get in broader, broader policy, um, arenas, it gets to be more difficult because there isn't the ground truthing as much. Um, but it works just as well with policies, and it works in my mind just as well at the state and national level. Um, it's just not the norm, and so people, you know, from my vantage point, they tend to sort of fall into the trap of transactional decision making. Um, and there's always going to be some of that, right? I mean, for those of you who saw the movie Lincoln, you know, and it was all over the 13th Amendment, you know, when Lincoln needed a few final votes, he, he was going to work out some deals with a few people that were purely transactional. Um, I think that, um, you know, what I have found at least over the years is that at the federal level right now, I, I honestly don't know how to tackle it other than to try to change who's in elective office and see if that will disrupt things enough. And that's maybe the reason Trump got elected. Uh, but not with the Trumpian style of governance or governments, but, um, but to get people who are willing to really um, do things differently and get them in, a, in positions like in Congress where seniority is such a big deal that they're there long enough that they can really make a difference. I was told, and I have had other people confirm it, that when this freshman class, this new class just came into Congress, uh, that on their own, there were 60 members or something, they got together and they said, we are going to do things differently. We're going to be civil, and we're going to work together across the aisle. Now, we don't see any sign of that, right, in the way Congress is operating today. 
But, you know, if that's 60 people and you've got 365, is that the number or is it 465? It's a lot of members of Congress. Um, and you can start building that, then I think things will will change. But at the federal level, you know, when I got this fellowship, it was before the election last year. And and then after the election, the, the foundation came to me and they said, hey, will you take on this issue federally as well? And it's like, no, there's no way. I have no idea how to grab that that piece of it. Um, and I don't think I have any better ideas today. Um, <clears throat> So I, I think some of it is really um, engaging enough, those of us who care about how decisions are made, that we we try to help get people elected to office who kind of get this and will stand up for it and use it. So term limits. I mean, ultimately, I think term limits should be the voting booth, but it doesn't seem to work very well. Um, and uh, I think if, if term limits are long enough that it gives an elected official enough time to learn the job, which is not, by the way, six years, uh, to learn the job and then be effective and work it for a while, I think, you know, uh, term limits can really be useful, um, is my sense of it. Because when I, I was in the legislature, I served six terms. I knew that last term, there were two-year terms, was going to be my last last time. And it wasn't because I didn't think I could get reelected. I was kind of, at that point, kind of a walk in the park, my campaigns. But um, what I was trying to watch within myself is how much I became too ingrained in the system and either less willing because there's risk in taking on something new and getting battered, um, you know, how willing I was to take on new and challenging issues, and how much I was becoming ingrained with the internal politics of the institution. And I was starting to see that happen with myself, and I, and I was attentive to it because I saw it happen with virtually everyone who stayed too long in our legislature, and I think that's true of legislative bodies often. So even though I'd, you know, I'd love to say, God, I think we should just have the voting booth and people should know when their representatives are, for whatever reason, people keep putting the same people in office. I think it's just so difficult uh, sometimes to, uh, to remove them. And maybe, maybe that's one of the ways to sort of get this succession going on that we need in terms of elected officials. Please join me in thanking Ralph. Thanks very much Thank for a Thank great talk.